Hi everyone, it's Peter, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, this time about the work of uh, Peter Paul Rubens. Peter Paul Rubens is a particularly important example of a Baroque painting, uh, a Baroque painter in uh, Europe in the 17th century. Um, dates 1577 to 1640. Um, <clears throat> Rubens is, I suppose, a one, one way of beginning to think about him as a kind of logical outgrowth or progression in a sense from uh, the career and work, especially of the artist, the Venetian artist Titian. Um, Rubens, from a relatively early age, finds himself uh, very much at home in uh, aristocratic or courtly uh, circles. And this begins with his uh, education uh, really as a teenager and this continues all the way to the end of his uh, to the end of his life. He um, has a, a number of important uh, commissions and positions uh, in uh, relation to uh, significant uh, figures in royalty and aristocracy uh, really all across Europe. Uh, Charles I of England, Marie de Medici of France, King Philip IV. Um, we're going to focus in this particular talk on uh, his cycle of paintings for uh, Marie de Medici. It's also worth pointing out that uh, Rubens's education was definitely of a higher standard than would have been typical uh, for artists in the 17th or even uh, 17th or 16th centuries. Um, he uh, is reasonably uh, fluent in a number of modern European languages and also Latin, which enables him to uh, correspond and converse uh, with scholars, and we have records uh, of that. He acts as an art agent and indeed combines art uh, making, buying, appraising, and diplomacy. Um, his uh, art, and that was the right word here, entrepreneurial skills are excellent as well and his workshop uh, is able to produce uh, substantial amounts of uh, finished works for his um, patrons in a relatively uh, swift time. This is reminiscent uh, perhaps of uh, an artist like Raphael. In other words, Rubens really has it together um, as a kind of courtier, as an artist, um, uh, and um, you know, as a sort of cultivated, educated uh, man of the world. We're going to look at uh, probably one of his most well-known uh, commissions, and that is the cycle of paintings of the life of uh, Marie de Medici. These are uh, being produced between 1622 and uh, 26, and they form a series of rather large um, uh, canvases the uh, arrival of Marie de Medici at Marseille, uh, which we're going to look at now, look at now uh, measures approximately almost 13 feet in height and almost 10 feet uh, in width. So that's a substantial uh, number. Uh, it's 21 uh, historical, allegorical narratives and portraits. So uh, 24 pictures. Uh, along this size in uh, th three or four years is, is a remarkably productive enterprise indeed. Um, <clears throat> Marie de Medici is the Queen of France, but she's not particularly popular. Um, she, in particular, has a great deal of uh, conflict uh, with her son Louis XIII and is not uh, particularly popular with the people of France. She decides to um, push back against that in a number of ways. She has a new uh, palace built, the Luxembourg Palace, and of course the decoration of that palace is where uh, Rubens comes in. It's quite interesting to think of the situation. There aren't too many um, in European art at this point. Uh, too many examples of female patronage on this scale. Uh, we have examples of uh, women such as Isabella d'Este, for instance, uh, importuning the likes of Leonardo da Vinci or Le Giovanni uh, Bellini. Um, but by and large, the notion that a woman would you know, single-handedly commission a building and the interior decoration of that building, is it's, uh, it's relatively rare. And Rubens, 
in addition to all his other many skills, certainly knew how to uh, elevate and amplify the reputations of his patrons and to flatter them in an extraordinarily tasteful, uh, extraordinarily tasteful way. Um, the goal of the Marie de Medici cycle, therefore, is to offset uh, the um, unpopularity and bad reputation she has. And as an outsider, she is from the, the House of Medici um, in Florence. We're certainly familiar, at least, with the, the 15th and 16th century Medici. Um, uh, as an outsider, uh, she's going to have an, an uphill road to follow regardless. So Rubens is brought in, and this is generally uh, the, the embarkation, uh, sorry, not the embarkation, the arrival, disembarkation at Marseille is generally regarded as probably the most successful of, uh, of the series of, of paintings. Uh, she's been um, represented here as uh, getting off of a boat um, uh, that would have taken her from the ship proper into the harbor uh, at Marseille. So she would have arrived uh, in France uh, on the shores of the Mediterranean after sailing from, uh, I'm forgetting the exact journey now, whether it's Genoa or Livorno, but regardless, uh, after, a, after a sea voyage, she arrives in France. And so what Rubens has done is really adroitly mingled the concerns of contemporary uh, royal uh, political identity and authority uh, with a um, an interesting melange of classical mythological figures, and and this is kind of why I'm thinking a little bit of the comparisons with Titian. Titian, of course, has uh, all kinds of patrons, uh, especially uh, in mainland Europe, and knew how to flatter them primarily through the means of portraits, but also in his so-called poesie, the um, sort of poetical, allegorical, mythological scenes. And we have ample, ample evidence of uh, Rubens' interest in Titian and uh, more generally speaking in mythology. So how does he combine these? Well, what we see is Marie de Medici looking uh, magnificent in this long uh, satin dress. And she is attended by various handmaidens and greeted by this personification of France with this extravagant blue cloak uh, festooned with um, the uh, emblems of uh, French royalty, the fleur de lis. So it's, France is, is in a slightly lower position and a, a, a kind of, you know, welcome, welcoming her in this um, theatrical and, and uh, dramatic way. Above uh, this figural grouping of Marie and her handmaids is uh, a personification flying through the air of, um, of fame who is on wings and trumpeting uh, the news. Um, the whole uh, scene occurs on a slightly slanting, again, think of Titian and his use of diagonals, brilliant red and draped uh, gangway that joins uh, the boat itself, an extraordinary uh, mixture of sculptural and sort of painted representation. You can see this captain um, uh, overseeing the whole thing here. Um, then this escutcheon, the sort of shape in the upper left here with the uh, Medici uh, famous orange balls. Um, so you get this sense of motion and dynamism typical of the Baroque with diagonals and movement and all, and all the rest of it. Um, probably most spectacularly in many ways is the figural grouping below uh, that gangplank. Here we have um, Neptune and his nereids, Neptune raising, um, uh, I should say, Neptune pushing sort of like a tugboat um, and holding, raising up his trident. Uh, directly next to this cannon going off as a kind of salute. And again, dramatic sounds are implied and, and light uh, there. Um, nereids are probably, the Nereids are probably the most spectacular feature of this entire ensemble. These three women who are basically like the three graces. Um, they're shown from the front in profile and from the rear um, as they uh, help along with Neptune pulling, 
uh, the ship fast, uh, or the boat, I should say. It's a smaller auxiliary uh, boat. Um, hold, pulling it in and then tying it fast to this pier that the right most uh, nereid uh, is, is holding on to. And, and it really emphasizes Rubens' A adept quotation of a classical cult, sculptural series, which could have been represented in painting and drawing as well, the three graces. Um, the sense of divine grace or providence uh, acting directly to ensure the arrival of Marie de' Medici. And even more spectacular in, in a, a kind of understated way, although one of the sailors on board on the left certainly casts an appreciative glance down toward the Nereids, an extraordinary representation of women and women's bodies. Um, Rubens, throughout his career, shows a particular gift for the representation of, of women and not kind of slender and lean uh, Greek goddess types, but much more full-bodied and, and probably more realistic in terms of proportions and also very realistic in terms of the coloration of their bodies. Um, he, in a very well-known short uh, sentence, cautions artists against being too um, uh, enthusiastic about emulating uh, uh, Greek and Roman sculpture because what it does, that emulation does, is kind of cancel out the sense of life or motion uh, within the figures you're trying to create. So what he does with the um, what he does with the with the uh, Nereids is is have this incredible, incredibly kind of um, accurate representation of skin tones uh, ranging from cool blues and greens to much more florid pinks and reds, uh, typical of the actual uh, human uh, skin surface. This very coloristic approach in uh, Rubens' art will be emulated uh, in later years, particularly as we go into the um, uh, middle and later uh, 19th century, that is to say the time of uh, Impressionism artists looking for guidance on how to uh, work with color more imaginatively and, and in some ways much more accurately. Rubens is very big on reflective uh, light and color. Uh, they turn to Rubens for a, um, a kind of example to follow. It's also worth pointing out that in uh, the um, later years of the 17th century where French classicism uh, becomes very dominant, especially in academic circles. Uh, Rubens is seen as an alternative to the much more controlled and precise uh, mode of, of painting that is typical of the French artist Nicolas Poussin, of whom more later. All in all, it's a spectacular production which really uh, illustrates, and Rubens was uh, very, very good at sort of marketing himself and, and um, you know, promoting his brand, as it were. Um, it's a very, very um, plausible somehow, and um, let's the, well, think about the right word for this, um, welcoming, uh, positive image of uh, Marie de' Medici that even if you weren't necessarily a huge fan of the figure herself, uh, you couldn't uh, fail to appreciate this extraordinary painting.